And welcome to episode 40 of the ForensicWeek.com show. I'm your host, Tom Moriello, coming to you from Laurel, Maryland. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, Laurel, Maryland. I'm no longer in Indian Shores, Florida, and it's a little bit colder than it was out there, but that's okay. I'm CEO of Forensic IQ Incorporated and professor at the University of Maryland Department of Criminology and Criminal Justice. Before I forget, I want to give a very special thanks to Paul Rodriguez, uh, a dear friend who produced our new opening video clip that you just saw. Uh, Paul, great job. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Tonight, computer forensics and cyber crime. For computer forensics is a branch of digital forensic science pertaining to legal evidence found in computers and digital storage media. Cyber crime includes traditional crimes conducted through the use of a computer and the internet. Learn the truth about these forensic topics with special guest Jim Christie, retired special agent with the Air Force Office of Special uh, Investigations, that's OSI, and president and CEO of the Christie Group, LLC. Ladies and gentlemen, ForensicWeek.com is a talk show that features real forensic science by real forensic scientists, investigators, educators, law enforcement officers, and counterintelligence experts who find, research, collect, and examine forensic evidence in the performance of their duties. Broadcast live right here on your desktop every Thursday evening, 7 to 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, right here on www.forensicweek.com. We are a proud member of the Hangout10.com live TV, uh, <coughs> excuse me, live TV webcast network, which is a series of shows recorded and broadcast live using Google+, a social networking service. Forensic IQ Update Report is researched and presented live by my student interns from the University of Maryland, who keep you up on current issues, events, and training opportunities that are important in the forensic community. Student producer and interns with us this evening are from Stevenson University's Derek Wong, who is our producer this evening, University of Maryland criminal justice major student interns, Alexandra Mitzel, Carl Zenowitz and Emily McGowan. Before I introduce our guest and begin this evening's discussion, let's hear from the producer of ForensicWeek.com, Derek Wong. Derek? All right, thanks, Tom. Um, as always, if you have any questions or comments during or after the show, uh, or if you have any suggestions about future shows, you can email us at ForensicWeek at gmail.com. If you have any questions for our guests or our interns, during the live broadcast on YouTube, you can use the comment box below, and I'll bring that comment up during the show. Uh, remember, if you like the show, please subscribe to our channel by clicking the subscribe button below. You can also find the ForensicWeek.com show on Facebook, where you can like and share our page. Thanks for watching. Thank you, sir. I missed one special guest here this evening, and that's Mark Lombard. Uh, those of you who've been watching Forensic Week since its inception, almost it, our year anniversary is coming up in a couple of weeks. Mark Lombard was an intern with, uh, with ForensicWeek.com last, uh, last semester. Uh, he's a very, bu very busy man this semester, getting ready to graduate, uh, working on a couple of internships, and interested in forensic, uh, uh, computer forensics, and asked and told me he was going to watch the show, and I said, look at one step better, I want you on the show. So, Mark, great, uh, great seeing you. I hope everything's going well this semester. Good to be here, Tom. All right. Now, one more thing before I introduce our guest. Last week, um, we talked about uh, alcohol use and abuse with uh, Dr. Beck and uh, 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 Jim uh, Fell, and we had a, a guest, Jordan Rad, who was the tour guide when I went down to the Yingling uh, Brewery down in Tampa, Florida uh, a few weeks ago. And I asked her to come on because when we went through the tour, she gave me something interesting. And Jim, I don't know if you're aware of this, and I'm going to share that with you, that um, 
beer bottles and cans in the cases that they come in have some very re, um, unique numbers, more unique than I, we ever thought. We knew that they didn't have serial numbers like uh, manufactured products, but um, they uh, are more significant that, than I thought. They actually can bring us down to within one minute of being brewed, where it was brewed, the date, the time, right to one minute. And only 900 to 1,000 bottles or cans are made uh, each minute, 24-7. So anyways, at the end of the show last week, my biggest critic, if I want to know how the show really went, I, I finish the show, I go upstairs, and my wife tells me how it really went, what she liked, what went well, what didn't go well. And she said, uh, you know, it was very nice seeing Jordan again, but I'm not sure how important that information was to the show. Well, when we were driving home 17 hours from Florida to Maryland last Saturday, um, we were listening to uh, Headline News uh, Satellite Radio, which is part of CNN, and they have these real um, crime um, dramas. Sometimes it's the actual uh, courtroom uh, um, video, I mean audio. Anyways, they were talking about this real case. And the key piece of evidence to prove that the defendant in fact, was involved in this murder was that they found three bottles of, of beer in his apartment in a search warrant and a bottle that was at the crime scene. The four bottles total were made within a minute of each other, which showed that they all came together in one package. And the jury said that was the key evidence that made a difference to find him guilty. So my, my wife turned around to me, which is not very often, and she says, you know, you were right. It was important. Uh, so um, I'm glad that uh, we discussed that. And uh, Jordan, if you're listening, thank you again. Let's introduce our special guest, Jim Christie. I've been asking Jim on on for a while, and uh, he just re recently retired. He is the president and CEO of his company, the Christie Group LLC. He's a retired OSI special agent. Um, he was chief of the Air Force Office of Special Investigations Computer Crime uh, Investigation Unit from 1986 to 2006. Um, uh, he was director of operations of the Defense Computer Forensic Laboratory from 2001 to 2003 and director of the Defense Cybercrime Institute from 2003 to 2006. And he retired but came back as sort of like a, a reemployed annuitant. Um, and from 2006 to this very year, he was director of Futures Exploration, which ever, whatever that is, and I think we'll find out tonight. Uh, Jim, thank you very much for coming. Um, it, it, it's nice to finally get you. You had to retire for me to get you on the show, but that's okay. Uh, don't mind that at all. How you doing, my friend? How you doing, Tom? Thanks for inviting me. Great. Well, let me just tell you. Our viewers come from across the world, really. Uh, um, a lot of them are students, both in high school and college. Uh, we get, we have law enforcement officers. We have professors of, of forensic science who actually use our shows as curriculum in their um, in their own courses uh, that they teach in forensic and criminal justice programs. So. Um, Tonight's subject uh, is going to be very important, especially for, for faculty who don't have a lot of background on this, and, the, and they'll use that. So I appreciate you coming. And I want to, we always start off with uh, clarifying terms because that, you know, we need to understand terms before we can understand anything else. So can you make the distinction between computer crime, cyber crime, and computer forensics, or computer, uh, forensic computer science? We, we hear all these different terms. Tell us what they mean and how they're different. Sure. All the same. All the same, whatever. In, in the old days, we called it computer crime, and it evolved because computers changed. So now uh, it, it's cyber crime, and the reason is that uh, 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 evidence comes from more than just computers. You have GPSs, you have uh, uh, wrist watches, you have uh, programmable appliances. So... Um, so we expanded from computer to cyber to encompass all the different potential uh, pieces of uh, uh, evidence. Now, you started your career as a computer person, is that correct? Correct. I started as a system administrator and then a, pro and then a programmer. All right. And then you, be then you went into investigations. Correct. And why did you go, why did you go from 
from uh, the, the systems administrator to investigations? What caused you to do that? Uh, I was bored, basically. <laughs> I mean, I, I was at the Pentagon. I was a programmer, and I was writing, you know, really critical things like uh, parking control systems for the for the Pentagon. You know, and that, that was kind of bored. And, uh, they created the Air Force Office, the Special Investigator created the very first civilian computer crime uh, position. And I said, wow, you know, you get to stay with technology and carry a gun. Well, that's, you know, every kid's dream. So uh, I applied and got the job. Uh, why don't you explain a little bit uh, about when you say you're a special agent for OSI, for the Air Force, uh, a lot of students, a lot of people don't really understand what that. So uh, stop, uh, talk a little bit about what your jurisdiction was and what does an Air Force OSI, what is their responsibility? Sure. Everybody's familiar with the TV series uh, NCIS, Naval Criminal Investigative Service, top show on television for about nine years. That's Air, OSI is the Air Force version of the Navy Criminal Investigative Service. So we're federal agents, and our jurisdiction is basically uh, uh, anybody who works for the Air Force, anybody in the Air Force or the Department of Defense, and anybody who victimizes the Air Force or the Department of Defense. Okay, very good. All right, so you get into investigations and you focus in that area. Now, typically, criminal justice majors are people who typically want to be law enforcement investigators, really don't have that, they don't work from the, the left, side, left side of the brain where uh, people who are good in, in technical things are. So how has law enforcement approached this? How do they make sure that law enforcement investigators, both federally and in local police, uh, have at least enough knowledge to understand the significance of, of the computer as a piece of evidence? I'm, I'm not sure they have. So, um, it's still... I, I knew that, Jim. That's why, that was just to get you talking. <laughs> the, the Air Force uh, actually did it differently than everybody else. Uh, most law enforcement agencies take uh, cops and investigators, and then they send them to a two-week or four-week course to teach them computers. The Air Force took a different tack. What they did is they went out looking for computer specialists and then trained them to be investigators. And so the, the, as a computer crime investigator, when I first started, we weren't really case agents. What we were are specialists to go out and assist the uh, case agents on uh, 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 the computer aspects of an investigation. Obviously, that's evolved over the years now so that uh, computer crime investigators are running cases today. You know, um, Prince George's County, uh, in fact, I think a... A retired Prince George's County uh, computer forensics guy, I think, ended up working in your program, if I remember, because his daughter was a student of mine. Isn't that correct? Yes, absolutely. Yes. All right. Um, and I know Baltimore City has a computer forensics unit. Uh, so um, I, I don't. I did, I, in the in the few cases I've worked as a civilian now with my company, it seems like the computer people are doing their thing. And I'm not sure if they're establishing a good nexus between the, the investigation and how the, the uh, computer evidence can help them. Is that a problem? It is. And, and it's uh, cyber investigations and digital forensics is extremely expensive. So state and local law enforcement really have a problem uh, hiring the right people. So they've taken multiple tacks. Uh, some of them, you know, take the, the street cop send them to a class, or they learned it on their own, and they get all the uh, computer crime cases. Or what they'll do is they'll uh, uh, hire a consultant. Uh, for digital forensics, which is a lot smaller, uh, uh, narrowly focused uh, than the investigation itself, those a lot are just civilians, uh, not sworn law enforcement, that are supporting an investigation. Are you, are saying, you saying that, that police, police departments are actually hiring, hiring contractors? contractors? Yes. Well, that's, that's, that's good, good to hear, here, but they get money for that too, than, right? A lot more expensive than growing your own. Yeah, well, yeah, but if, the problem is that if you grow your own, law enforcement still, if they're doing a good job, they're going to get promoted out of there, right? 
Right. You know, and that's one of the things that we didn't do in the Air Force was career broadening. Most law enforcement agencies, uh, they'll take a specialty like cybercrime, and you'll, you'll be in a regular investigator, and maybe this, this uh, assignment, you'll be a polygrapher, and we'll send you to training. You'll be a polygrapher for a couple of years. Then you move back into something else. Uh, we we tried to keep our uh, invest our computer crime investigators computer crime investigators for their entire career. Uh, I, does it make sense to train somebody for four years, and, and as soon as they become competent, you know, start over again? Just doesn't make any sense. Private industry would not would not go out and spend money to train their personnel for them in two or three years to be transferred. Uh, yeah. I, I, I could just go off on that because I just, I just truly believe we're always going to need experts in every field. So why don't we just make them experts and keep them there, if we can motivate them to stay there. Right. You Kip, have you to have a career path. Absolutely. Uh, Kip, Kip, you had a question. Yeah, I had a question for Jim. Um, I did an article uh, a few weeks back, and it was about a company in Austin, Texas, called Flashback Data, in which they would have computer. Uh, software or computer hard drives and they would send it to this company in Austin, Texas and they would uh, go through the computer and decrypt anything that was on the computer, any evidence that could be possibly used and I was just wondering what you thought about a company that would do that for us compared to training someone to do it inside a force and it's for a small sum of course there's always money involved but it may be cost effective for them to do that and as long as they follow the you know uh, stringent uh, uh, chain of custody re uh, requirements that that law enforcement agency requires uh, it's probably okay uh, but you don't want to just bring any Tom Dick or Harry in there and you know and you know lose your chain of custody but uh, if you don't have that many cases uh, it, it's probably uh, more cost effective to contract it out and that's why regional labs for state and local make make a lot of sense. The FBI has been doing that for a while with regional computer uh, 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 forensics labs. Uh, they provide the infrastructure and the policy and, and the hardware and the training and then the lo local law enforcement agencies provide uh, the migrant workers. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, Jim, would you not say that any time there's a crime or a, and you have a crime scene and there's a computer in there that that automatically that computer should be uh, taken as evidence? In, in the old days we said that and, and our motto at at the uh, Defense Computer Forensics Lab was seize all find all. Well now there's so many different kinds of digital devices that uh, if you do that the lab will never ever be able to get through all the media, uh, so so it's it's incumbent upon the investigator to kind of narrow it down what might be relevant, and and it might be that you have to seize everything, but you, it, you know when you do that you have to pay the price at the other end because it's going to take a long time to do it to process it. It, well, that, that's right. It, it, that's like with any evidence. It's like you don't go into a crime scene and lift every latent print that's in the crime scene. You exactly. you focus on that. Uh, but I, you know, I remember that I had to call you to to get the name of a um, of somebody, a civilian, to, to do some computer forensics for me in a case, and uh, it was intriguing because the law enforcement agency they they took the hard drive, but I, I'm convinced they never looked at it. I mean, they never looked at it because when I gave it to to uh, the guy that you, uh, his name was Gross. In right. fact, he was from Stevenson yeah. University. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. He and I said, look at. I don't know what I'm looking for. I need to know everything about this victim uh, because I, you know I was representing the client. You know, the, the defendant. I said, I want anything in there that would tell me, give me a good understanding of the victim. And he came in. He gave me so much good information really good information uh, that, that established a profile of this guy right. and, and not only that it helped me prove that uh, any DNA that may have been on my clients clothing um, because he he was in the crime scene earlier that night you know as an innocent access thing and uh, 
uh, because of some uh, some video porn videos we found on the hard drive, uh, the fact that my client had his DNA on it. Anybody who goes in there and takes the coat off and sits down for a while was going to walk away with his DNA anyway. So that became important. Became important. All right, let's talk about some of the traditional problems associated with investigating computer crimes, like uh, jurisdictional problems. Does the, does the state want to prosecute some of these cases because they're hard, they're hard to investigate or get convictions, or are they? Jurisdiction is interesting because with cybercrime, the, the, the subject doesn't have to be in the same location where the crime occurs. So who, who has primary investigative jurisdiction in that particular case? So in a, in, if you have a hacker case and, and the guy uh, hacks through 27 different computers in 27 different states to get to the final victim and, uh, you know, trashes that computer or steals somebody's identity, you know, who has primary investigative jurisdiction over that case? Is it where the subject was? Is it where the final victim was? Or was it the other 27 uh, uh, victims that he hacked through to get there to the final victim? Uh, that's my question, so answer it. Uh, the answer is everybody. And oh. nobody, everybody thinks they're in charge. And so uh, uh, it's really difficult. And, and, and then you have to go to each jurisdiction for... Uh, subpoenas and search warrants, and then you have to re-educate uh, the uh, the uh, prosecutor and the judges all along the way, which is really time-consuming. Okay. Um, what is the extent of the problem uh, in reference to this jurisdiction? Uh, is it causing crime not to be prosecuted because they're just too frustrated over who's going to uh, who's going to take it over? Or is, uh, does it, if it's crossing straight state lines, doesn't it become a federal uh, jurisdictional? Uh, Absolutely, thing? and 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 uh, but they're overwhelmed. So f federal's only going to run uh, the cases that are uh, in a, in a particular in hacker cases. They're going to go after the advanced persistent threat nation states. They don't really care if uh, uh, some some kid hacked into a system and. Uh, and deface the web page. Uh, so how do how do they decide, you know, the level uh, of the significance of the crime before the, they need to investigate it? I mean, obviously, child porn, whatever, right. no matter where it is, uh, they're going to go. What kind of crimes are are being investigated all the time versus ones that uh, you know discretion is being used? Well, child pornography is the uh, the world's uh, most prolific. Uh, cyber crime. So and, and so, uh, cyber uh, child pornography is one of the uh, cases where the technology actually enables the, the the crime. So in the old days, if you wanted to be do if you wanted to be a producer of child pornography, you probably had to have your own dark room and and your own uh, photography equipment, and then and then you probably had to mail the the pictures or the magazines. Uh, so the two uh, law enforcement agencies that were uh, most uh, involved were Postal and Customs. Uh, but today, Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah, okay. But today, everybody has a digital camera, so everybody can be a producer and worldwide distributor of child pornography. And, and, and you know, whether they get paid for it or not, they're still a distributor, and, and these guys are trading them like baseball cards. So... Uh, and now you have movies, so you know, sad. But every every at at the uh, uh, defense computer for forensics lab, we used to have lots of VIPs coming in from around the country, and so the the head of the national police for India came in, and so we asked him, "What's the number one cyber crime?" He said, "Child pornography." You know, it's everywhere. All right, so uh, how have the criminal statutes changed? You know, as you know, as technology changed, how how have the law have the laws kept up with technology? Actually, the laws really haven't changed a whole lot, and we we've, we've been able to assimilate the crimes into the existing statutes. So the statutes actually actually cover everything. It's whether the prosecutor understands the case and can prosecute it. And then whether the jury and the judge understand what the prosecutor said. 
All right. What, what, well, what kind of uh, explain a, an investigation? Are we looking to find uh, the the actual video uh, the uh, um, in a hard drive, or, or is it just is it if you just have child porn downloaded into your computer, that's a crime in itself, is it not? Well, not necessarily. It's it's not uh, illegal to possess child pornography. It's a crime to knowingly possess child pornography. So with forensics and with the investigation, you have to f prove to a jury how that, how that child pornography got there and that the uh, subject intended to get it there. And, and if you have a, a computer in the house that's common use and everybody uses the computer that, and there's no logins uh, for different profiles, then who actually did the downloading? So that you still have the traditional investigative techniques that you have to apply along with the digital forensics to find out how that person actually uh, got the child pornography on the system. And did it, you know, did, was he just surfing regular porn and uh, a picture showed up and it happened to be a kid? Or did, was he out there searching uh, for a, a good young chicken? You know, so uh, makes a difference. You know, if if he if he uh, pulled up a child pornography video, played it 27 times, you know, the forensics are going to show that, and uh, th that's going to show that he knew he had it. So the forensics are going to be able to show. They're going to be able to look at the hard drive, uh, look at where it is, how long it's been viewed, the time it's, uh, how long it's been put up on the screen, and everything. Absolutely. And in in what for what, what period of time? Anywhere from four or five seconds versus two or three minutes, or or or, or they've seen the same one over and over and over again. All of the above. So you know the forensics, the computers capture everything. It's just a matter of having the tools and the technique and the expertise to go find it and extract it. Uh, now I know the FBI has uh, has a unit that works on this. Did OSI? Do, do all the federal agencies have units doing child pornography? Absolutely, and a good portion at the Defense Computer Forensics Lab, probably uh, thirty-five percent of the criminal cases were child pornography cases. So, and and they, you know, there's no social level for this for the subjects. It's all the social levels. Uh, I guess it was uh, probably six years ago, the judge advocate general for the Air Force, you know, the head lawyer for the Air Force, was doing child pornography on the, on, on the Pentagon system. You know, so, I mean, you know, the intelligence community, it happens all the time and, uh, 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 and shows up in the reinvestigation polygraph for the, for, for, for the intelligence community. Um, difference is they don't turn it over to law enforcement. <laughs> yeah. They use it as a lever against the person that works for them. Do I have any questions from the... Uh... Yeah, I actually have a question. Um, so a couple minutes back you mentioned when hackers go through different states computers. What happens if they go through like another country's computer? Do you have to work with that country to get permission to like look into their stuff or anything like that? Does it get harder? absolutely becomes much more difficult. So now you have to you know, work with the legal attache uh, in that country who has to then work with the local, the local police and, and you know in some cases uh, they may not have a capability to investigate or they may not have laws against what happened so they are prohibited from investigating or in some cases they're just bad guys and they're not going to help you. So absolutely uh, uh, compl compliment, uh, uh, you know, uh, really complicates the, uh, the investigation. Does it ever make it become untraceable? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So you have to use, you know, we, ha we had a, a, a famous case back in 94, and we had all kinds of tools and techniques, and we couldn't trace this, this group back who were breaking into DOD systems. And so we went to the traditional investigative techniques, and we went to our sources, confidential informants. Three months later, uh, one of our confidential informants said, well, hey, I had a co chat, online chat session with this guy, and he said he did it. 
well, within a day, we had pen registers up on the guy's phone, and uh, we had him hacking. So, you know, not just technology. Yeah, thanks. So you mean good old-fashioned investigative principles still uh, still reign? Yes, but <laughs> but the more we get civilians. Uh, doing digital forensics who don't know anything about investigations and we separate those guys from the investigator who sees the the, uh, the evidence and send it to the lab there's a disconnect today um, so it doesn't help the investigation you know I know I know in my agency we uh, we were trying to take everyday investigators and send them to these six months uh, schools to learn this, uh, they would come back, and of course, it was only an assignment for them. And by the time they really understood it, they were gone. So then we said, okay, let's go hire computer scientists. You know, like you, you kind of did. Well, we did that, but they, uh, I know I talked to several of them, and they were getting bored because the kind of work they were doing really wasn't that exciting to them. Have you noticed that uh, being a problem? Absolutely. You know, when, when I first started, I, I was given the opportunity to go out and actually work the cases with the case agent. So I, I did a lot of traveling uh, worldwide, working on cases, uh, being, a, being a different uh, state for three or four weeks, working on the investigation. Uh, so, so it was much easier to pick up and learn the process. Uh, and I'm working with a seasoned agent at that point. So it helped me with my experience real quick. Today, there's a major disconnect. Mail the you do the investigation, seize the evidence, send it to the lab, give the lab a little bit of guidance. They go through a checklist, and then send stuff back. You know, it's it's not the not the way we ought to do business. To the law, there's a lot of law enforcement officers uh, that are are watching this show uh, that probably come from jurisdictions where they get no training. Right. Uh, now I know that your your old organization that you just retired from. Uh, did a lot of training. Uh, did you do training for of local law enforcement also, or was it just federal? It, it turned out to be just federal. In the very beginning, when we started, we we were tr we were, whenever we had a vacant seat, we had a we had a call list, and we were calling the state and local law enforcement agencies. Hey, can you can you fill this seat? And and all the seats got filled. Uh, the uh, Air Force General Counsel jumped in there and said, can't do that. Posi Comitatus, uh, they came up with the Economies Act, they came up with all the reasons why the federal government couldn't train state and local law enforcement. And uh, so so that's why I created a, uh, a program called, CD, we called it CDFE, uh, Center for Digital Forensics Academic Excellence. And what we did was took our academy that trained all the uh, uh, digital forensics and, and, and cyber investigators and DOD and other federal agencies, and we built some standards, and and then we shared that with through this program with different colleges and universities, and then we uh, 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 designate schools their program for digital forensics. Stevenson University is one of them. Anne Arundel Community College is one of them. Uh, so so now when you when you have a you get a degree in digital forensics it means something at, at our lab we get a we get a person I had a young lady really really sharp young lady and she was working for me for a year and I had her running a conference for me she wasn't doing digital forensics but every one of her brothers and sisters was a uh, 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 a cop a detective or a cop for Baltimore County and she had just graduated from Stevenson University with a uh, uh, bachelor's in digital forensics. So after a year, she said, "Hey, I would like to co. I want to go back. I want to go to the lab. Will you support me?" I said, "Absolutely." So we moved her over to the lab, and they give her some tests. She couldn't pass any of the tests. So then we ended up having to send her to our academy to go through all the schools. Well, she was a contractor, so that cost us about 180k to train her give her a mentor for three or four cases before she could fly solo on a case. Mm -hmm. So we created this program so that when people come on board, they can hit the ground running because they've, they've met certain standards. Uh, so we certify uh, the actual examiner. 
and we designate the different programs, school programs, as as uh, CDPA programs. Very good. Um, I wanted to mention to you that you know, you know, when you have the lawyers tell you what you can't do, you're trying to do something good, and and you know, they 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 let the law get in the way of it. Uh, Jim, when you and I first met, I was the director of the IOS, the Interagency OPSEC Support Staff, and my I had a responsibility to provide operation security training to the national security community. That was my uh, that was my requirement, my mission. After 9/11, uh, when President Bush stood up uh, over there uh, in, in in Ground Zero, and and called every law enforcement officer and fireman the first responders to our national security with that statement I took that statement and said excuse me I think the president just told me I can train law enforcement in, 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 in firefighters and I turned around and we created operation security for them and the lawyers started calling me up I says hey go check your president and come back and talk to me <laughs> you know and they let me alone you know and uh, I mean it's just crazy sometimes Hey, listen, it is, I'm looking at the clock. It's uh, 36 minutes past the hour. I'm going to give you a little break, Jim. And when we come back, I want to talk a little bit about the profession. Um, you know, these high school kids and college kids who are interested in what you're saying and saying, hey, I think I would like to do that. We need to give them a path to go. So I want to talk a little bit about that. And while you're resting a little bit, I'm going to ask my uh, three uh, interns, Emily, uh, Alex, and Kip, to uh, tell us... Uh, what they've been looking at uh, this week and what stories are up on the blog. Uh, any one of you can start, whatever's, wherever you want to go. Okay, um, so the first article I looked at this week related to last week's show on alcohol use and abuse. Um, there was a case just recently in Orange County, California. Um, they were doing an audit of their crime lab and found out that one of their instruments to determine BAC was calibrated incorrectly, and this affected 2,200 DUI cases. Um, they blamed it on a human error for the calibration. It was a 0.003% difference, and it's going to change about 200 cases. It's going to decrease 0.01% BAC and drop, I think they said, a couple dozen cases um, from 0.08 to 0.07, which will be below the legal limit. And there's now, now the lawyers for all for that jurisdiction are going to just say, hey, if this was wrong now, what else is wrong? Let, by the way, Jim Fell, uh, our guest last week, sent me an email. One of the things we didn't talk about last uh, last week and is that uh, a lot of jurisdictions want to change that to 0.08 to 0 0.05. Uh, so uh, he's going to come back at another time and talk to us about why and whether that's going to fly or not. Okay, very good. What else you got, Alex? No problem. Um, my second article was about an advance that we just made in blood state analysis. The Teesside University in England just came out with a prototype camera to detect blood stains at crime scenes. Uh, the camera is designed to detect trace amounts of hemoglobin, and it also helps estimate time of death. They ran a bunch of tests in their lab, and it came out accurately. Um, so this is going to revolutionize the old way we used to process blood analysis. I didn't, I didn't understand how it's going to help with time of death. Can you explain that to me? It didn't go into that too much in the article because I was a little confused on that too, but it said as, as long as they get a fresh blood sample, they can get it within a couple, they can tell within a couple minutes when the blood stain occurred. And the camera is going to pick up something? I guess it's something in the hemoglobin or something because the article didn't go too much into that. It was just explaining what it does, not how it does it. Okay. All right. Very good. Um, and they're hoping in the future to include other liquids with this new camera use and idea. Okay. Very good. Thank you. And that's in the blog? Yep. All okay. Blog. And, that, and it's forensicIQinc.com slash blog. Okay. Very good. Uh, who's next? Emily? Hello. Uh, so my first article is on neuroscience and juvenile courts. Lawyers have been increasingly bringing brain scans um, in order to contest the competency of their defendant at the time of either committing the crime, uh, the statements that they say during a police investigation, or even when they're kind of confessing to the crime whether or not they were competent. About 5% of murder trials now involve neuroscience. Neuroscientists, though, have mixed feelings about this. Um, some are saying that they're used too often or often used incorrectly. But as of now, judges are the ones who have the final say. Uh, 
I really, I really believe brain scanning is going to be associated with the next generation of, of not polygraph, but lie det detection or truth verification, because they're doing a lot of work on, on brain scans and in and, and parts of the brain that change when a person knowingly is saying something that is uh, that's stressful. You know, that's good. What else you got? Uh, so my second article is on undetectable guns. And because of 3D printing, it's completely possible to make a weapon out of plastic. And there's a current federal law on undetectable guns that says that a gun manufacturer must use a certain amount of metal when creating the gun so it can be detectable in a security scanner. Uh, the law is about to expire in December, so Congress is debating it. And part of the debate is uh, some members of the Democratic Party are arguing that parts of the gun, major parts of the gun, should be uh, made of metal to keep them. Jim have, Jim, have you heard about guns that can be made completely with plastic? The, what I heard was that the, the only piece of metal in there would, could, would need to be would be the firing pin, but it's possible just with the firing pin. Uh, and and um, Emily is saying that there's federal statutes that says that a certain percentage of the gun has to be metal. Is that correct, Emily? According to this article. Okay. Well, and that's what we believe the article, right? <laughs> okay. What? You got anything else? Uh, no, I'm done. Okay. How about you, Kip? Excuse me, as I roll in here. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Um, my first article is about digital evidence warrants. Um, author John J. Barbara from ForensicMagazine.com talks about how there's a kind of an idea that one must execute a warrant within 10 days of the warrant being drafted. And because of that, they also believe that the forensic, forensic uh, investigating must also be done in those 10 days and so all information from the computers that they might seize or any digital evidence that might be found is expected to, is not actually expected to be used in 10 days and he the author Barbara goes through how it's not expected to be done in 10 days and how it's a misconception by most investigators Jim, is there a specific amount of days, to your knowledge, uh, when you get a search warrant for digital evidence that has to be served? Not for digital evidence, I don't think. I think it was uh, whatever the, the state is or whatever the federal law is. I don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Uh, Kip, what else? And my second article in relation to this week's topic, I found a article on something called the Omnivore Field Kit. Now, this uh, videotape evidence was pretty much the big thing uh, back in back just a couple of years ago, but now we have moved towards the digital vid video recorder, also known as the DVR. Um, there are many disadvantages to having this DVR because there's no actual physical tape anymore. Everything's stored on a hard drive. So now um, this kit created by um, Ocean Systems um, is capable of plugging into any type of video plug at, on a certain system and is capable of downloading in uncompressed files and able to be previewed before a case goes through and during the case itself. Um, it just seems like it's a really easy way to obtain security video evidence from gas stations or stores or anything like that. Uh, I'm glad you brought that up. Jim, you know, I had a, a, a murder case where the police literally only took, a, it was, there was a DVR, they took only the, the time period that they believed the crime occurred and nothing else. And then six days later they find out that something valuable was in it earlier that night. So they go back to, because they didn't take the whole darn thing, they go back and six days later uh, it's already been re uh, 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 recorded totally. over. Yeah. Why would anybody not just take the whole thing? Probably uh, ignorance and uh, maybe resources. So it depends. Some of the systems are pretty antiquated. Uh, 
you know, so it may they may not even have had uh, the ability to make a copy. They 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 might have had to depend on the the, the convenience store or the gas station to provide it to them. Yeah. Okay. Well, this was actually an apartment building. Okay. Um, uh, Kip, Emily, uh, Alex, thank you very much. Jim, let's get back. And again, uh, anybody has any questions? And Derek, if uh, any questions come in, please uh, interrupt us. Um, let's talk about the profession. Um, you've already talked a little bit about you and you know where you started. Um, you know, you get we got high school kids uh, that are taking forensics courses throughout the country. You know, and they're starting to think. And I, I have a lot of them that come to me or send me emails and say, "Hey." I like computers. Uh, I'm interested in computer forensics. So first, what should they do? What should they study? What should they major in? And then, uh, if there, are, you mentioned some schools, but if if you knew any other schools around the country, that would be helpful too. So, see how you can approach that. Okay. Um, first, you have to get them excited about digital forensics. So, um, and. What we did was at DC3 we created the DC3 Digital Forensics Challenge. So it was actually uh, about 25 different exercises at five different difficulty levels that we started putting out about seven eight years ago. And um, you know at the 100 level through 500 level, 100 level, you know if you can do a Google search, you can figure out how to solve the problem. Uh, all the way up to the 500 level where uh, we really don't know how to do this yet. So what we were doing is putting out a tool requirement. We need a tool that can do such and such. Can you, you know, so uh, we would build a test bed. So uh, hopefully kids can get involved in that. And we had multiple categories of winners. Unfortunately, due to sequestration and budget uh, and f furloughs and all that nonsense, uh, DC3 uh, just finishing the last challenge on 1 November. So uh, n don't know if who's going to pick that up or, and run with it. Well, uh, what kind of kids uh, were, were involved in this? Well, we had, uh, we had kids from uh, middle school, high school, really? uh, community college, undergrad, graduate level as well as companies, military, government officials. We had categories for all that. And we had probably about 1,800 teams from uh, over 50 countries participating. Wow. Did, did you get any uh, employees out of the program? Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. So uh, uh, university at uh, Wilmington University in Delaware, uh, Anne Arundel Community College, uh, Stevenson University, so yeah, absolutely. How about UMBC? Do, do, do they have a program? No, they don't. Uh, they 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 focus on information assurance rather than digital forensics. I hear. You. I hear. You. Okay. Uh, all right, very good. All right. So I'm in high school, and I love love what you're saying. I'm excited. I'm. You okay? No, your mic's not working. Well, welcome to the Jim Christie Show. <laughs> <laughs> no, nope, I think your microphone is dead. All right, well, Jim, while, while Tom's going out and come back in, um, one of my friends actually took a... a digital forensics class at the University of Shady Grove last semester and he said that the instructor told them that there's a way to track an image like trace it back to the date and time it was actually taken like if they took it off of Facebook and they like inputted it into a website is there any way if like an image was emailed that you guys could track the date and time that that specific photo was actually taken it, the, the answer is it depends on the equipment that was used and what was enabled, uh, what software was used. But absolutely, if if all things come together, um, and you can you can pull a lot of information from the metadata from the actual picture uh, to the network logs, the system logs, 
uh, the transfers. So absolutely, yes. Okay. Um, Jim, I also have a question. Um, so other than uh, child pornography, what are some of the most common types of computer or cyber crimes that uh, law enforcement agencies need to deal with? Well, we didn't deal with it uh, much in DOD, but identity theft is the biggest. So uh, we've seen the criminals move uh, from just challenge and, and, and vandalism to try to make money off of things. So uh, if you can steal credit card and identities, uh, you can make money off of it. So you're now seeing organized crime uh, all over the world. So like you were suggesting earlier, you know, that makes it a whole lot more difficult when you have uh, uh, groups from Russia and uh, 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 Eastern European countries uh, or South Africa or so yeah absolutely okay so uh, do you have any suggestions for uh, anything that we could do to protect ourselves from like identity theft or any other types of cyber crimes yeah don't use any computers <laughs> That's kind of hard. <laughs> so today, you pays your money, you takes your chance, you know, because you're completely dependent on others. So it's the weakest link. So if you do business online with a business that doesn't have a security pro uh, a, a policy or person, you may be in trouble. So you have to pick who you want to do your online uh, 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 purchases with, your online banking with. Banks are probably pretty secure, but uh, you have to be careful who you're dealing with because you have no idea of their competency when it comes to information security. Can y'all hear me right now? Yeah. Hey, welcome back. Oh, I got. I don't know what happened to my. Uh, did you hear that noise? We, no. Oh, I heard this big loud. It was just. I, I, I ended up getting rid of my microphone and doing a headset. So I, I apologize. Um, anyway, did you keep on going? We did. Okay, good. Thank you very much. All right, so what I was saying when I was rudely interrupted by the noise was if I'm in high school and I'm interested, what should I, should I major in compu uh, computer science or what? Well, now you can actually uh, uh, major in digital forensics. So any of the technologies are going to apply. But if you want to really specialize as a computer crime investigator or digital forensic examiner, there are actual uh, programs for that today. But will that limit you? I mean, if you if you focus, sometimes majors are so limited that if you decide not to do that, then all of a sudden you're not as uh, uh, interested, interesting to uh, a potential employer. I don't think that's going to be the problem with digital forensics. Um, because there's not only in the criminal side of the house, but also in civil litigation, uh, lawyers need, for e-discovery e purposes, need digital forensic examiners. So, uh, and if when you learn digital forensics, you're already good. It's all got, automatically going to make you a uh, uh, an expert in information assurance, computer security, cyber security. So. The American Academy of Forensic Science has a digital forensic section. Uh, the academy is broken up into various sections, um, and we're going to talk about some webinars they're having uh, um, uh, in the, over the next few months before our meetings in February in Seattle. Uh, but uh, that obviously is growing. Uh, but are the jobs growing? Absolutely. Um, yeah. You know, I'm I'm going to be running a conference coming coming up in April and May. And what we're doing is we're expanding it to uh, not just comp uh, law enforcement agencies, but to the private sector and academia. Because what we need are cyber hunters. Uh, whether you're a private sector employer and something goes bad internally, you got to do your own investigation. You can't depend on the government, number one, to protect you or to come in and investigate. They just don't have the resources. So you're going to have to be able to figure out what happened on your own. So not just like you have computer security people, you're going to need you're going to need cyber hunters uh, uh, in in your in your big companies. Now, these programs, I know you you mentioned several in the in the Baltimore Washington area, but um, are there some in the other parts of the country? Yes, uh, Oklahoma State University, 
uh, Norwich University. Uh, so yeah, so they're 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 Daytona, uh, Univ University of Daytona. So yeah, they're all over the place today. Very good. How about yeah? You know, how about majoring in that and also majoring or minoring in criminal justice? I would imagine that would be a great. Thing. Absolutely. In fact, th I always recommend that they take criminal justice uh, minor because uh, you got to understand the investigation and what you're looking for. You go to an examiner and and they're running a child porn case and you say, you know, what are you looking for? And they say child porn. So no, you're looking for elements of proof that prove the possession, knowing possession to child porn. They, they and and you get a blank stare. Very good. Uh, tell us a little bit about the DOD Cyber Crime Center. What is that? And who who's responsible? What kind of cases are, are go through there, etc. Well, it, we created. Because uh, we wanted one forensics lab to support all the agencies in the Department of Defense. And they run uh, uh, cases for everybody today. So, uh, uh, when you say it, beyond the, be, beyond the Department of Defense? Occasionally. Okay. You know, on a case by case basis and fee for service. But uh, the main support is for the Department of Defense, law enforcement, and counterintelligence organizations. So they run espionage cases, they run uh, uh, terrorism cases, they run a lot of child porn cases, uh, uh, fraud cases, you, you name it. Uh, if there's digital evidence, uh, it gets sent to, to the DOD cybercrime lab. Great. We're going to be uh, we're going to have some guests from Stevenson talking about fraud. Uh, I don't know if you know uh, Professor Tom Coogan. Uh, he, uh, he's, he was with the Secret Service a number of years ago. He runs the uh, forensics program at Stevenson. and So he and another professor. Who is the other professor, Derek, that's going to be on the, on the show? Uh, his name's Colin May. Okay. So, um, so we'll, we'll, we'll have to talk to him a little bit about how they uh, handle that particular area. Uh, what other crimes um, uh, does the uh, DOD uh, uh, Cybercrime Center deal with besides the ones you already mentioned? Uh, homicides, uh, uh, sexual assaults, uh, it, same thing that every every other law enforcement agency would have to deal with. Uh, we don't do a whole lot in the financial identity theft uh, arena, but uh, uh, crimes against person and property, fraud, uh, counterintelligence, counterterrorism. Okay, okay, great, great. Uh, Jim, uh, you know, the hour is almost up, and, I, and as I told you, the hour goes really fast. And uh, the idea of the show is to, uh, uh, you know, to, to get some information out so people can start thinking about it. And um, what we like to do is, is eventually have a follow-up show uh, and get in, into some more uh, details and stuff, if you don't mind. I, I really appreciate you coming. Um, uh, for those of you who uh, who are listening, um, you know, uh, Jim's. Uh, Email address is there. If you have any specific questions for him, uh, I, I'm sure you, uh, Jim wouldn't mind. Uh, if you have career mentoring uh, uh, questions, uh, Jim has been uh, done that. Jim, uh, I mentioned earlier, Jim and I traveled all over the country for uh, various counterintelligence uh, organizations, uh, doing training, conferences, etc. Uh, and um, uh, he's uh, does it well and. Uh, uh, so uh, he's now he's now I uh, got his own company. Tell us a little about your company. What do you uh, what kind of stuff are you doing with your company? Well, what we're doing is we're uh, since the government is out of the conference business, we're we're resurrecting, reincarnating the DoD Cybercrime Conference that we ran for 12 years. Uh, we're resurrecting that as the U.S. Cybercrime Conference, uh, which will be held in Leesburg, Virginia. So go to www. .usacybercrime.com. Okay, very good. And in fact, uh, Derek, can you is that is that the website right now? Is it up? Yes, up and running. Have yeah, call uh, for papers out right now. Looking okay. Very good. Very good. Uh, we'll get we'll get that up and re, uh, in and remind people of that. Uh, let me also remind uh, folks uh, that the uh, American Academy of Forensic Science webinar webinars. Um, our started last night. The criminalistics um, section was out there. This uh, it's a series of free online webinars on forensic science, career choices, and development. In fact, uh, Derek, uh, you listened last night. Tell us a little bit about your experience and what you thought of it. 
Well, um, when I listened in yesterday, I it was about criminalistics, and uh, they had a lot of really good information about uh, just like interviewing for a job, a lot of career development related information. So I found that to be very enlightening because um, as a student, it, I think it's definitely a good thing always to get more information about that. Yeah, uh, yeah. the American Academy of Forensic Science um, uh, focus for, for this year's meetings is mentoring students uh, to come into to the field. So they talked a lot about uh, examples of jobs and, uh, and the work done there, how to get jobs, how to go through the interview, how to dress for success, and um, they talked about different types of masters and PhD programs, etc. Um, next uh, next week uh, on the 27th, uh, the digital and multimedia sciences section. That's what it's called uh, at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and then the engineering sciences will be December 3rd. December 4th will be the general section. Now, the host of that one will be yours truly, Tom Moriello. Uh, I was asked by the general section because that's the one I'm in. The general section is made up of about 12 or 13 different uh, career fields. If, it, if it's not large enough to fit into one of the, uh, to the various categories they have, then it goes into the general section. So I'll be talking about that. Anyways, uh, pay, uh, if you go on to the American Academy of Forensic Science website, um, you will see that and you can register for it uh, and, and participate. Uh, I see our time is up. Let me just mention that next week, November 21st, uh, we will have a fingerprint expert, Tim uh, Ozendarp, who was retired from the Maryland State Police, who, also, who now works for Stevenson University. Um, our thanks to uh, special guest uh, Jim Christie. Um, nice to see you, Mark, uh, uh, after uh, not being on for a while, busy uh, studying. Um, I want to remind everybody that ForensicWeek.com is being brought to you through the cooperation of the Hangout10.com live TV show network. We recommend that you go to the Hangout10.com website and see the schedule of other shows available for you to learn and be entertained. Meanwhile, tell all your friends and colleagues to tune in and keep watching ForensicWeek.com live every Thursday evening, 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and view uh, also our archive shows. All 40 shows uh, that have been done this past year are all there for you to view. Uh, so please do that. I want to thank Derek uh, for producing the show. Again, Paul Rodriguez for creating our new uh, intro. And with that, See you next time, and thank you all for watching.